Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Yeah, community matters. And it's not just little communities, it's bigger communities. It's national communities, it's global communities. And here we are with Bob Fishman to talk about communities. Uh, and the title of our show, Yes, We Are Already Living in Interesting Times, out of the old Chinese proverb. Hi, Bob. Bob Fishman yes, joins us from the mainland. Thanks so much for being with us today. Pleasure to be here, Jay. Thank you. So I wanted to tap your brain and get your wisdom and your perception and your vision on some things that are happening. And I'm particularly uh, interested and excited to do that in view of this book I'm reading. And the book is called 21 Lessons for the 21st Century by a guy named Yuval Noah Harari, who is an Israeli historian, teaches in Hebrew University in, I think it's Tel Aviv, and has written three books along these lines. Uh, the first one was about the past. The second one was about the future. And the third one, which is the one I'm reading now, um, and it's called 21 Lessons, uh, is about now leading to the future. Um, sea change. It's all about sea changes and evaluating where we are and trying to get a bead on what's really happening under our feet. And Bob Fishman is, is my guru about that. <laughs> so here we are. We're going to really make some we make some introspection here, or extrospection. So the first segment, we're going to talk about interesting times in Hawaii and the U.S. And the first thing we're going to talk about is relationships. Uh, it's all about relationships. In this case, it's the relationship between Hawaii and the mainland. And it's changing, right, Bob? Yes, it is. Uh, well, in many ways, Hawaii's issues have become more insular, uh, but in, in many important ways, Hawaii has gravitated toward the mainland uh, way of thinking, uh, the, the, way, the mainland way of seeking information. Uh, and when you say the mainland, it's not monolithic either. We are closer to Southern California and to the West Coast than we are to other parts of the U.S. mainland. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, once upon a time when, back in the 1960s when I showed up in Hawaii for as a, as a young squirt, uh, you know, Hawaii was very sensitive about being told uh, what to do and what to think and how to live by the mainland haoles. Uh, uh, the mainland haoles that showed up as business executives did a good job of building a wall between themselves and the local population. Uh, but Hawaii was going through a, a the beginning of a very positive uh, and unifying uh, evolutionary process uh, as it sought and achieved statehood in 1959 and in the early 60s. Uh, we were all together in trying to earn a seat at the table in the United States as one of the 50 states. We were trying to be economically self-sufficient. We were trying to set up guidelines for ourselves to preserve our environment. And we started a crusade which lasted about 10 years for equality among the various racial elements of the melting pot of Hawaii. Uh, leaders related to that, people related to that. There were very few people who took a position against the notion of the melting pot and the notion that we should be sitting at the table with the rest of the, the other 49 states. Uh, and our ticket to ride was tourism, our ticket to ride was the beginning of some research and development and the beginning of a university system, uh, which was part of the crusade that that uh, Governor Burns uh, pursued when he was elected in 62, and he stayed in office for almost 12 years. Uh, George Ariyoshi was the fiscal conservative and the visionary who believed very strongly that we should try to plan our society better so that even to the extent of precluding people from moving from the mainland, to Hawaii, which he tried to, uh, he, he, he investigated seriously and was found that was that felt that that proposition was constitutionally weak. Uh, he launched a state plan, uh, which attempted to get the legislature to try to be visionary and how to plan the, the state so that it could grow and we could live comfortably within it. At the end of the Ariyoshi era. Uh, John Y. Hay became governor, and his, his 
major, his basic contribution was opening up government. It was under his leadership or his administration that the Information Practices Act was passed. And all of a sudden, people had remarkable access to government records, which they never had before. Uh, that opened up the opportunity for controversy. It opened up the opportunity for the media uh, to play in new depths that it never had done before. Uh, and of course, uh, they, uh, that was a period of time when Hawaii was spending on infrastructure at a rate that it could not afford. Under, under the Caetano administration in the 90s, what wound up happening was we had a hiccup in our economy, we had a hiccup in our infrastructure, and we we slowed down a lot of this growth that we had enjoyed for the decades ahead. And the Lingle administration showed more of a management instinct, and when the Lingle administration was over, uh, ironically, what I thought was the greatest opportunity for Hawaii under Abercrombie uh, was uh, to socially re-engineer our society at the hand of someone who had, was educationally qualified and motivated to do it. Now, I think he found the task was too much for him, but that was the beginning of the current stress that our society in Hawaii is facing now, and that is a massively shrinking middle class and a, a major drop in the opportunity for social mobility, very, very similar to what it was right after statehood when if you wanted to become a doctor, you had to go to the mainland to get the education. If you had a, wanted to be a lawyer, you had to go to the mainland mm, yeah. to get the education. Yeah. yeah. But but we have evolved, and we're actually starting in some ways all over again, uh, because Hawaii isn't one society anymore, as you pointed out at the beginning of your talk. Um, the Hawaii is multiple societies all operating in parallel, and each of which is seeking its own leaders, and each of which is nurturing its own their own values. So we, we left the whole idea about the melting pot. You know, I always like to make the dichotomy between uh, the early days as cargo cult, where whatever came from the mainland had to be good, and then the later days as paranoia, uh, whatever came from the mainland had to be bad. Um, and I think we've gone on, on that kind of transition. I don't think we're in the melting pot anymore. We're somewhere else. And there are people who would really rather have all the Howleys go home. Um, and, I, and I wonder how you feel about that. Well, I don't know. Actually, uh, it's an interesting way of looking at it. Uh, I think that you have pockets of uh, political and social uh, uh, energy throughout the state. If you, you go out to the community in Kihei, uh, it's hard to find a Democrat around there. <laughs> it's very, it's very, very Caucasian. You know, the Wailea Kihei part of Maui, uh, parts of West Maui are, are very Caucasian. Uh, if you go out to uh, what used to be a very Filipino community in Waipahu is now a heavy uh, Polynesian community out there, Samoans uh, and others from, from other Polynesian environments. Uh, I think what you see is a major shift in in uh, the social profiles in Hawaii, and the Hawleys are not the are not the issue anymore. Uh, Hawleys have oh, over the last ten years have grown to become about fifty to fifty five percent of the population, uh, you know, by count. Uh, but the entire population isn't melted together as it was at one time, which is one of the reasons we have such controversy. In pursuing our political leaders, mm -hmm. because because uh, we have microcosms within the political community where once upon a time there were issues like statehood and like environment and like uh, fair treatment for all races and like uh, openness in government. Uh, those are things which brought people together because political leaders were able to to underscore their importance for all. We've run into a real problem with the ability to manage government in the last 10 years or so. Uh, I happen to be one who's tried to manage government uh, back in the 1990s, and I believe in the truth that government is fundamentally an unmanageable enterprise. Uh, anybody who tells you that he can run a government is probably uh, exaggerating. Nobody runs government. They steer it. If they're good, they yeah, steer it. Yeah, I'd like to uh, add. A, I'd like to add a thought to that, Bob, and that is, 
uh, and, and I think George Ariyoshi, as you mentioned, was involved in this, is uh, government uh, or somebody has to manage foreign investment. Um, and in, in an island state, you know, you, you especially which is part of the United States, and we do have a commerce clause, it's not that you can bar anybody, but you do have to manage the money, the investment, the projects coming in. And uh, the, nobody else can do it but government. So if government can't manage the local society, it's more difficult still for government to manage uh, the enterprises coming in, especially when those enterprises uh, are bent on trying to uh, get government to uh, approve their projects. And so um, I wonder how you feel about that. I, I think there was a time when we were sentient on the issue of managing foreign investment. I think Frank Fossey might have been part of that. Um, but I think now we, we really don't uh, even try to manage foreign investment. It just comes in and does what it wants. And there are sometimes very adverse effects when that happens. What do you think? Well, I think you're right uh, in your focus there. The, uh, I, I happen to think that investment that comes from offshore, whether it's from the mainland United States or from the, from the, uh, the West, from the, from the Orient, uh, is easier to focus and easier to, to guide through a political process or through a, uh, an approval process because the constituents, the stakeholders, are not part of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. They're not here. And if you take a stand that they don't like, then with the possible exception of them providing resources to your political opponent or giving some kind of exposure to, uh, uh, to someone who's not your friend uh, that might cause you some problems, uh, you, they can't. They have really no recourse except to take what you say, and just that's what that's what Frank Fossey did. He he made uh, the uh, onus of building a golf course on Oahu a very expensive proposition for Japanese investors, and some of whom paid it, and some of whom said, "No, that's just too much," and and uh, and they had no no recourse. They had nowhere to go except just to go away and go to somewhere else and do their development elsewhere. Uh, I think that the real problem is that money has become a very important, a much more important commodity in guiding public policy than ever in recent history. Uh, not only political contributions, but also the ability to make stakeholders in political groups very wealthy by hiring them or by investing in them uh, in ways that are legal. Now, the ways that are illegal, the government, should, you know, the FBI and the government should go after them. But the ways that are legal are investing in, in joint ventures and in purchasing real estate. Um, you know, for example, you have a wonderful uh, set of buildings that are being built in Kaka'ako today. Uh, I would say a very large percentage of the very expensive properties will be what economists call traded commodities, which are not intended for local people ever to live in. And I wonder whether anybody will ever live in them but they're being purchased as financial investments, which will make them money over time uh, and give them, with some some credibility, a place in Hawaii to be part of our society, you know. But, uh, but these are uh, ways for very wealthy investors, very wealthy stakeholders to participate in the society without breaking the rules. Yeah, so if you, if you, um, if you talk about management of the investment, and you talk about management that um, is, you know, appropriately respectful of the future of these islands and of the social groups on this, these islands and, and, how, and how, you know, the islands will evolve going forward. Uh, a lot of people say that, that those commodity buildings are really not a good idea because there's only so much land, um, and that's the wrong direction. And so the question, I suppose, is where did we lose touch with our own future? Where along the line of the leaders that you mentioned uh, did we stop caring about the future of the people in, you know, in the melting pot? Uh, how has leadership changed over these years? How has politics changed? And, and how has growth and um, management of foreign investment changed uh, over those years, can you say? Well, yeah, I think, first of all, I think the, the notion of uh, leadership uh, has morphed from what was early on in Hawaii's youth, its statehood youth, 
uh, very transformational. Uh, we we transformed, we moved from Governor Bill Quinn in 1962, 59 to 62, uh, the first elected governor, of course, he was appointed by Eisenhower before stated, uh, to Governor Burns, to John A. Burns. And and the, the, the society didn't didn't shudder when that happened. There were a lot of policy changes, a lot of faces changed. Uh, Burns uh, focused on his important, his crusade, but on the whole, he's, he was a very transformational leader. Burns was a very transformational leader, the kind of a leader that had the ability to transform the followers to his way of thinking on, on moral issues, on uh, visionary issues, on longer-term issues, because they believed that inside this leader there was goodness or wisdom or some character attribute that was worthy of following. Uh, and that particular type of transformational leadership, we saw it with John F. Kennedy, we saw it with several other uh, national leaders. Uh, people liked the person's image, the people liked uh, the public, the following uh, could identify with the values and the morality of this individual and the visionary, visionary underpinnings. What I, what uh, I hear you saying, we, Bob, is that, is that a transformational leader is more nutritious, more helpful, um, more visionary, pointed in the right direction. And we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, I'd like to talk about the other kind of leadership that you mentioned to me before, and that's the transactional leader, and distinguish between one and the other, and where we are now in terms of the quality of leadership. That's Bob Fishman, former city managing director. Uh, we'll be right back uh, to talk more with him about the sea changes in Hawaii. Hey, Stan, the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And they won't let me do political commentary, so I'm stuck doing energy stuff. But I really like energy stuff, so I'm going to keep on doing it. So join me every Friday on Stan, the Energy Man, at lunchtime, at noon, on my lunch hour. We're going to talk about everything energy, especially if it begins with the word hydrogen. We're going to definitely be talking about it. We'll talk about how we can make Hawaii cleaner, how we can make the world a better place, just basically save the planet. Even Miss America can't even talk about stuff like that anymore. We got it nailed down here. So we'll see you on Friday at noon with Stan the Energy Man. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. Okay, we're back on Community Matters here on a given G Monday. Uh, I'm talking with Bob Fishman, one of my favorite guru people, my personal <laughs> guru when it comes to Hawaii history and understanding it and understanding the sea changes and understanding these interesting times and how we got here. So we're talking about leadership, and leadership is so important in any community. Certainly it's important nationally now, too. Um, but, and we heard a little about transformational leadership uh, which is a very important thing, a concept for Hawaii. But then it led to, or maybe it competes with, transactional leadership. So, Bob Fishman, can you tell us what transactional leadership is? Sure. Uh, first, let me, let me just uh, add one thing. Transformational leadership, per se, is not po a positive thing. It is a type of leadership uh, that, in, any, in an or any type of a formal organization, has to be balanced with other types of disciplines and talents and the ability to transact business uh, and, and balance out with a transactional profile as well. When you're overly transactional, when you're over, overly transformational uh, to, the, to the exclusion of some of the realities, some of the back and forth realities, uh, you wind up with some of the frustration, for example, that President Jimmy Carter had in trying to change the world into a more moral place. Uh, you know, he was probably right in the way he was, what he was trying to accomplish, but from a practical point of view, he may not have had the, the, the toughness or the, the, the negotiating uh, toughness to go forward with it. Uh, transactional leadership is very simple. You do something for me, and I do something for you. You pay me the rent, and I'll let you stay in the apartment. Uh, 
uh, you give me money for my campaign and I will give you access. Uh, uh, that's why uh, uh, ethics laws and politics are so difficult to write and so difficult to enforce uh, because money and resources have become an extremely important part of seeking and holding public office these days. Uh, we have a president of the United States right now who believes that transactional leadership, you do something for me and I do something for you, you say something nice about me and I'll say something nice about you, uh, is the way to do business, is the way to be a leader. Uh, that is, in my mind, a questionable approach to being a national leader. For yeah, a but you, but you said that we need them both. We need them both. We need to have a balance. So how much... You know, and, and transactional leadership sounds like it's just an inch away from corrupt leadership, and we know we have that with Trump. Um, so the question is, how much can we tolerate before it goes off the rails? I hate to use that term, rails, but, but it seems appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, I hear what you're saying there. The, the, the person of the let's, the let's make a deal person who gets into uh, a, an enterprise leadership uh, is not necessarily a bad thing. There's some folks who have done extremely well uh, in a let's make a deal environment, uh, especially when you're talking about people in those enterprises that are transactional in nature, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, political leadership, social leadership, the ability to, to, to become the first citizen of Hawaii as the governor of Hawaii uh, is a combination of these attributes. You can't just pull the levers of government. I mean, Harry Truman said uh, when asked about Eisenhower that uh, how does he think Eisenhower will do? And he said, well, I think the general is going to be very surprised that when he gives an order, not a goddamn thing happens. <laughs> and he really did say that, you know. And and uh, and the point of the matter is, is that is that you need to be able to cause people to want to do what you want them to do, which in some cases is transactional, but it's also laced with a very very heavy heavy uh, coat of a visionary uh, behavior, visionary leadership, which is transformational. So government leadership is a peculiar hybrid. And when somebody gets up there and says, I will fight for you, uh, that image of a leader as a fighter may not be the kind of leader that we're looking for. And if they get up there and say, I, I love you and I want everybody to love each other and we have to have a peaceful place, that also may not be the kind of leader that everybody's looking for. I mean, we're in a situation in Hawaii where after Linda Lingle, uh, there, was a, there was a very acrimonious gubernatorial primary and the public rejected one of the candidates and elected another. Mm -hmm. uh, and for four years later, that is precisely what happened, which is how Governor Ige became governor. They rejected one of the gubernatorial Democrats, the Democratic office seekers, and they approved another. Mm -hmm. uh, in this particular case, uh, the uh, issues surrounding the current governor, Governor Ige, have to do with his image and his profile and how aggressive he's perceived to be uh, or how well he is believed to be able to manipulate uh, the mechanisms of a, of a complex government. I'm getting uh, it. I'm getting uh, it. So you, you can have all high ideals and everything, but in order to make it work, make it happen, make government work um, you know, for the community, you've got to pull the levers of government. And that's the practical side of things. And it's the transactional side. But I guess it's transactions made... Uh, as an agent for um, part of the government itself. The government is making the transaction rather than you putting your name on a hotel. Well, the stakeholders in a process, uh, in the process of government leadership, the stakeholders have become really good at protecting their stakes and eating them to it, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the, the, stakehold, the stakeholders are those people who guide public policy in the legislature, and those are uh, the, the most significant, the most prominent, of course, are our public employee union leadership, mm -hmm. uh, who guides public policy in our, in our legislature. They've, they've worked hard over the years and earned that, that status with members of the legislature. They, they're, the stakeholders are those people who come in with major, uh, will, the willingness to, to, to cause people to get resource for their campaigns. The stakeholders, in many cases, are those people who have points of view, social points of view. Uh, uh, the, the stakeholders are holding, are, are driving our government. 
Mm -hmm. uh, these, this, whether it's money or whether it's point, point, point of view, whether it's, a, it's the, 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 the loudness of their voices, we have become a transactionally motivated government mm -hmm. because stakeholders are really good at what they do to the exclusion of the person who really can't keep up with all this. Yeah, so now, what I get... What I get is that if you if you have all transactional, all stakeholders, everybody doing self-interest, uh, then you're doing that at the expense of transformational, and you lose vision, you lose um, you know uh, sort of a view over the horizon, you lose that idealism that maybe you need to have. So it goes back you, to your point about balance. You lose the wealth of that that the, the process of democracy brings into it. You know, probably the best the best way I've heard anybody describe it recently was in Barack Obama's speech last Friday at the University of Illinois. He he said, "Listen, one in five people, young people, and I guess he meant under thirty, one in five voted in nineteen in, in, excuse me in twenty fourteen. Only one out of five people in that age group voted in twenty fourteen." Uh, you know, when you have the vast majority of people in a particular age group uh, who are voting in a midterm election, uh, how do you expect them to be represented in the, in the, the government that is elected as a result of the, uh, the, the election process? Well, that goes to, the question to of, that goes to the question of trust, and I, we, we wanted to discuss that with you. Um, and okay. the, lo the low voter rate is really appalling and of great concern because it means that the essential compact between citizen and government is, is being eroded, degraded, and so forth. And, and to me, it reflects a lack of trust by the electorate in the government. This is of great concern. Are you concerned about this? Yes, I am. Uh, there are two levels of looking at it. The first is that people have to have trust in their representatives to represent their point of view honestly and, and com compassionately. But they also have to have trust uh, in the professionals in government to be able to do what it is that they've been hired to do. There's always been some kind of cynical attitude toward people who uh, take a government paycheck and don't deliver what they promised to do. Mm. Uh, the second thing is that we need to trust not only the character of the people that are in in, in positions of responsibility, but also uh, the competence of the people who are in positions of responsibility. And in many cases, you have a situation which is uh, where in the process, in, in the pursuit of preserving the process, you actually forgive people from doing anything positive or anything productive as a result of it. I had a sign on, on my desk when I was managing director that said, you know, if we all work together very well and we're sensitive to each other's issues and concerns and we watch out for the rules and the regulations of the, of the, of the government and the, and the place, uh, it's possible by working very hard we could all accomplish absolutely nothing. <laughs> and, and what, and really, and I had that sign. And, and the point of the matter is, is that is that you have to be able to accomplish what you promised. Part, the part of the problem which has eroded trust over the years is that political aspirants, political people who attempt to seek and achieve and hold political office promise what cannot be delivered because it gets them what they want. It gets them the votes that they want. It gets people to believe that, hey, they're going to go out there and fight for them, even if it's not achievable. In many cases, they don't even know if it's achievable. So it's, it's entirely possible we may wind up with things that are either unachievable or unaffordable or unmanageable, uh, like we have with some mega projects now that are going on in our state uh, that could have been better engineered and better designed over, over the, the times that it was that they, they were proposed. Well, that, you know, that goes to the question of uh, the entertainment factor that you and I were talking about, the sports, the sports competition that you and I were talking about. Uh, and, and part of the complicit in that, if not a, a major factor in that, is the way the media handles it. If the media makes it into a sports competition, if the media sucks in on distraction, because, uh, you know, there are politicians around who try to distract us, distract us um, to forget the promises they made, the lies they made. Uh, they try to move us ahead into other issues every day so we can't remember what they said. And we are cows, many of us. We are sheep. And the media helps, helps us become cows and sheep because they go along with the distractions. 
and the sports arena kind of approach and the entertainment kind of approach. Uh, you know, to me, all these things working together, what I just described, is a tremendous erosion in the, uh, in the ability of government to lead, in the ability of the people to feel aligned with government and to trust government, and ultimately an erosion of our democratic process. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yes. The, the, uh, first of all, I agree with you about the media. The, the media's purpose in our era, in our, in our time, is to spark emotion. It's to accelerate change. Uh, it's to become relevant. To the, to the way that we live uh, in our, in our uh, American society. Uh, they, I have found that over time the media accepts very little responsibility for the consequences of its participation, uh, any more than the folks who are calling a football game or a wrestling match accept any responsibility for the consequences of one or more of the athletes being hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the media reinforces polarization, especially in a tribalism mode that we are right now, where, where uh, television stations and publications uh, have found audiences, sufficiently large audiences, to be able to sustain themselves as enterprises. Uh, the enterprises that are emerging from this modern era in the media world uh, are different from what they were 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. There, is, there are no George Chaplins and Bud Smizers around anymore uh, to be able to hold the flag for truth and, and conscience. Uh, truth and conscience are not part of the priorities that I see in the modern media. Uh, if you turn on uh, any of the cable uh, uh, commentary stations today, they may as well be covering a football game or a World Cup soccer game. Mm -hmm. uh, they may as well be covering other types of competition other than political competition. And when that distinction fades, we wind up with a situation where the public is enjoying, or not, a vicarious set of thrills by watching players who contend uh, and compete. Some are, are destroyed, some are, are edified. And we take a look at it and say, what is really going on over here? Uh, we're heading for, as a result of all this, as a result of the Trump era, as a result of the, the uh, organized effort to stand up to what is, considered, what is considered by many to be unfortunate leadership in our country, uh, we're, we're going to see a period of media vigilanteism that we haven't seen before. And the reason for that is that it makes good business. The reason for that is that is that there's a battalion of investigative reporters where at one time we only had Jim Dooley, <laughs> you know, <laughs> working for the advertiser, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, and it's not about delivering information anymore. It is about calling a, a competition, commentating, providing commentary in a competition and accelerating the level of energy and anxiety in the society that follows it. Uh, I wish I could feel a little bit more uh, sanguine about the outcome of all this. I think that we're running into a situation where the lack of trust in our political leadership is going to be filled with something. We will trust somebody or some institution for a time until we find that that is not the place to go. Uh, you know, but I have a feeling that uh, the, what we know in the media today is, is very, very different. It's very difficult, for example, to make a local uh, print publication profitable. It's very difficult for it to sustain it. I mean, I talked to Mike Fish uh, when he was public, he was the publisher of the advertiser. Yes. Uh, uh, and the people they were bringing in, in fact, it was, he, he Gannett brought somebody in uh, uh, that uh, uh, was going to cover Hawaiian affairs. And uh, he was very proud that he got this young Turk, this young woman who was really good, coming from a community somewhere in the far, in the in the in the eastern seaboard of the United States, and they were going to send her to the University of Hawaii for a summer course so she could learn a little bit about the Hawaiian culture, so she could be the reporter on Hawaiian affairs for their advertise for the paper, you know. And I go, wait a minute, you might as well be a corporate entity on Mars selling a service to the people of the state of Hawaii in the form of delivering news. Uh, you don't have any stake in the outcome of, uh, you, have, you don't have any stake in the consequences of what your news coverage is really all about. And at the same time, there's a dearth of reporters who are covering the city council. You don't have anybody covering it. I think you have one person three-quarter time 
uh, uh, covering the city council today, uh, and you have a couple of three people covering the legislature because it doesn't make sense financially for these newspapers to do it. So we get poorer coverage, more opinion, and more participation in, publics, in the public's need for entertainment. And the arena of public affairs has become much closer to the world of entertainment than it's ever been before. What we've got to do, Bob, is to have more conversations like this. Um, you know, okay. so we can remember what happened, so we can sort of wrap our arms around it and understand the sea changes. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Bob. This is what Think Tech is all about. We really appreciate it. Look forward to having another similar discussion with you going forward. Thank you, Jay. It's a pleasure to be here. Take care. Okay. Aloha. Aloha.